Good evening. Honored to be here with you to share briefly with you um, about an experience that's been going on uh, in your local community uh, almost 10 years now. Uh, I don't have any pictures. I don't have any slides because what I want to invite you to do is when you leave here to travel two miles to MLK Drive and see it firsthand. You don't need a picture. You don't need anything. I just want you to drive down Martin Luther King Drive and see firsthand. I didn't grow up to be a redevelopment person. Wasn't in my agenda. Wasn't even something that I thought I'd be doing. But as I think back about, as I think back to 1964, growing up in Arkadelphia, Arkansas, I think back about what helped me shape Fitz Hill. It was my neighborhood. It was the fact that I could drive, or I could walk from vacation Bible school home. I could walk from school home. And my mother always told me before I left, don't let your name beat you home. <laughs> that meant anybody in my community could call and tell her that I, in my neighborhood, that I'd been bad. And I knew that there were consequences with letting my name beat me home. This she always told me, a good name is better than great riches. Your name is all you have. She told me many times, she said, Fitz, let me tell you something. She said, if people do not trust your word, they will never ask for your signature. Bankers will not give you a loan if they don't trust who you are. The neighborhood that I had in Arkadelphia was one of support, one of love, one of care, and one of discipline. So as I think back in 1964, growing up in really moving from the segregated South to an integrated South, I wonder that we really take a look on what, how did things look in 1960 when we had the support of the entire community. My close friend, my academic mentor, my business partner, Clifton Tolbert, talks about this in a book titled Once Upon a Time, Who Would Have Colored, which became a movie. I went to Tulsa, and I sat down, and I talked to Clifton about writing that, and when BET did the movie, what gave him the inspiration to write that book? He said when he was picking cotton in Mississippi, he was sheltered from a world because of segregation. And he could ride through the community, and everybody encouraged him. He said, when I came out of that community, things changed. He said, I didn't have that same support system. He said, Mama Pop and all the community who helped pick cotton disappeared. So now I had to prove myself every step that I went. Very interesting book. If you haven't read it, check it out. Because as I thought about my situation growing up, the support I had in 1964, 65, 66 in Arkadelphia, Arkansas, going on to Washtenaw Baptist University, going on to University of Arkansas, how I mainstreamed myself because of the support. So let me ask you about the 1960s. Let me ask you to rewind with me and let's think about how did 1960 look in the urban communities. What did the urban neighborhood look like prior to integration? I'm supposed to be a professor. I'm supposed to be a college president. So let me give you a quiz. Think about this. In 1960, did you realize three quarters of African Americans were born into a family of married couples? In 1960? In the early 20th century, do you realize there were 6,339 African American owned grocery stores in the United States of America? 6,000 grocery stores. Why are grocery stores so important? Community. Where you could go, you could get vegetables, you could get food in a community. I remember on Austin Street, uh, Cattle Street in Arkadelphia, Mr. Raymond Green's convenience store, where my grandmother would send me over to get bologna, cheese, tobacco, right there in the community within 50 meters from the step. Do you realize how many African American owned convenience stores in Little Rock today? Have you ever thought about how that builds community? One step further, in 1960, you realize in 1960, only 1,313 African Americans were in prison per 100,000 U.S. residents in 1960? Only 1,000. So you may say only one? Yes, because I'm going to fast forward to 2015 and let you really think about what has happened since the 
since the neighbor has left the hood. But that's how a neighborhood looked then. What are the significant moments that made Fitzhill think about this and change this? Let me tell you, I hadn't always been a college president, didn't grow up to be a college president. In fact, my goal was to be a college football coach and win a national championship. I love motivating young men, being in the locker room. That's why I don't write speeches, I respond to situations. And so as I was sitting there in, two th in, in the year uh, 2001, many of you might have seen the movie Coach Carter. Well, that's real. I'm in Richmond, California, recruiting. Got several players playing in the NFL, National Football League, and I look at this young man on film because I realized he could change his whole family if I could get him through college and get him a contract. The whole community. So the coach told me, though, Fitz, I said, I'm going to his house tonight. I want to see his family. I want to recruit this. This guy has potential. The coach told me, you can't recruit him. I said, oh, he's going to Stanford. I'm in San Jose, country boy from Arkansas. I said, hey, Stanford? He said, no, Stanford doesn't, doesn't want him. I said, well, he's going to USC. He said, no. I said, well, I got a chance. I said, I can't beat Stanford. I can't beat USC. But I can beat Fresno, and I can beat Cal. I said, I'm going to his house. He said, you're wasting your time. I said, I'm going anyway. I said, why can't I recruit him? He dropped his head and said, he can't read. I said, can't read? I said, he's in 12th grade. I said, how did he get in 12th grade if he can't read? I said, well, I have, a, I have a bigger question for you. I said, at 3.30 today, will he be at football practice or will he be in the, in the library getting tutored? He dropped his head. He said, he'll be at football practice. I said, that's mental abuse. So that's not fair. And as I went back across that bridge today, discontent became a catalyst for change in my life. And I realized just being a part of January 1st bowl games was not what God had called Fitzhill to do. It was how could I transform lives through basic literacy skills, which I knew would transform communities. That changed my life. That made me want to change my profession. Secondly, September 27, 7, 17 p.m., we've all had catalytic moments in our lives that change how we look at things but I have it on tape today. It's one of the nastiest things I've ever seen on tape when a young man walked down Bishop Street, right across the street from the college, and murdered Derek Olivier on our campus. Having to call his parents at 10, 15 p.m. and tell them your son has been shot by another man, another young man in the community, which I knew had no hope, had, and I told the police right there that night when they were investigating, I said, hey, I'm not a criminologist, but let me profile this young man for you when you find him. I said three things. Number one, he probably dropped out of school. Number two, he's unemployed, and he was fatherless. Go back to 1960, that was rarely the case with what I just told you. Those were significant moments that changed Fitzhill's life to say, what is the result of the neighbor leaving the hood and creating what we often call the ghetto? When I came to Arkansas, back to Arkansas, and I became the president of Arkansas Baptist College, I was told that Martin Luther King Drive was the hood. So when I was offered the job, offered the opportunity to become, Arcan to become the president, the 13th president of Arkansas Baptist College, as I drove down the community, I looked at it, and I only saw what it could be, not what it was, because of my experiences in Arkadelphia in 1964 a community of support, love, and opportunity. But what has happened since the neighbor has left the hood in 2015? Because I think anything can be measured can be improved. Do you realize in 2015, today, only 30% of African Americans are born into a family of married couples compared to 1960, where nearly 80% were? In 2010, you know how many African-American-owned grocery stores were found by the Kellogg School of Business in Chicago? One. From 6,000 to one. You want to talk about how you're going to grow a community entrepreneurially? If you have no food, you got problems. You want to talk about food deserts? That's what happens when there are no grocery stores. So how do you do that? What do you do? Well, you identify the problem, and you come up with solutions. Do you realize that unlike the 1960s, when 1,313 African Americans were in prison per 100,000 U.S. residents, you know how many in 2010? 4,347 are in prison per 100,000. 
58% of black youth do not complete high school throughout the United States of America. The greatest country ever that you have more people dropping out than finishing. And it amazes me when I walk through the airports and I see all of these foundations that have all of these things that they're saving at what we call endangered species and where the monies are going. And I see young men starving for leadership. And I have a problem getting funds to help educate. I really wonder what's the problem. I really wonder if America wants a solution, or does America inv value incarceration over education? Why? Because a Pell Grant comes at $7,000 a year, but incarceration is $30,000 a year. So I really wonder, where is our investment? And what are we going to do about changing those things? I told a senator one time, he said, well, President Hill, what is your goal to to, 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 as president, what is your vision? I said, to stop black on black violence by putting your neighbor back in the hood. He said, if you do that, you'll win a Nobel Peace Prize. I said, I don't want a prize. <laughs> I don't care to be recognized. I said, I want justice. My son, who's 14, 15 years old now, that when he leaves the house in Little Rock and he's driving next year because I bought him a car to know that he will be safe coming back. I want Destiny, who's 23 and going to be in grad school at the University of Arkansas, that when she's driving back, if she has a flat tire at night, that she can call me. I want Faith to know when going back and forth to work that she'll be safe like I was safe in Arkadelphia, that I could walk home. I could feel that in 1960. When we had less, we actually did more. Now we have more it's a crying shame, the results that we're getting. So, President Hill, what are you suggesting? Well, one thing I know that black on black crime is a very toxic subject. Very few politicians will touch it. Why not? Well, it can ruin your career. Statistics don't lie. It tells the truth. So, the thing you need to have, though, is a solution when you identify the problem. We don't need another panel discussion. We don't, need, we don't need to say what needs to be done. We need a solution. We're getting ready to start a civil rights responsibility movement. In 1960s, African Americans were blessed with their civil rights. It's now time from within the community to start a civil responsibility movement, which starts from within the community, the same, with the same intensity that the civil rights movement would start. See, the federal government only got past the civil rights because of the things that happened in the 60s. Rosie Parks and Dr. King, that was strictly entrepreneurship. Think about Rosie Parks when she didn't give up her seat. See, that same intensity has to come within the community. And Dr. King stood before the federal judge and said, OK, you can give me an injunction on this bus, but you can't give me an injunction on my feet. We're going to walk. That was entrepreneurship. <laughs> they passed when you sit anywhere on the bus. But what was it? It was sacrifice. It was sacrifice that took the place to move the communities. Was that the best thing? That's the question we need to answer. What if Dr. King would have said, well, we'll start our own bus line. I flew to Israel not too long ago on a Jewish-owned airline. See, when you have economics, and you bring something to the table, you bring, you bring, you come, you're at the table. I don't think people should try to remove people from what's theirs. I think you should create your own. In the year 2015, 16, 17, 18, African Americans will be worth $1 trillion over the next five years. If aggregated resources were together, would make them in the top 15 richest countries in the world. Then you don't have to ask for anything. You bring something to the table. When you bring something to the table, people want you at the table. If you don't have anything to bring to the table, people don't want you at the table. It's real simple. It's not, it's not calculus, it's basic math. So we're creating an action plan 
that starts with moral values, doing right, all right? Moral values. Well, moral values mean a lot of things to a lot of different people, okay? But here's what I realized. Grandma knows more at 60 than she does at 30. When grandma's 30, you got a problem. Because mama's probably 15. That's a moral value. It's important. In 1960s, my dear was 60. <laughs> Those are the values that must be reinstated to put the neighbor back in the hood. Access to education is vitally important. A dropout will drop in somewhere. We better determine where. So I love at ABC, when I got the GED program, we've graduated with 500 dropouts. They said, what does a college need a GED program for? I said, you, do you see my community? 52% of young African-American males are dropping out of high school, so I need a conduit to get them to college. University of Cal Berkeley School of Policy and Research uh, revealed that in the year 2000, only 5% of African-American males that enrolled in college committed a crime. Think about that statistic. So do you want to worry about graduation rates or do you want to worry about safety? Think about it. You're safer if they're in school, which then you just might get the light to come on. But if they don't enroll, that's when you're locking your doors. For everybody, more values, access to education, that's critically important. And last, entrepreneurship to develop urban communities. And Arkansas Baptist College has been a change agent for that for 131 years. Now, as I wrap this up, I want to share with you a story as I close. My time is coming to an end. William Karambizi, I'm in Rwanda. I meet him. He finds out I'm a college president. It's amazing when I'm in Africa and they find out I'm a college president, I become a rock star. I can walk through Chicago and East St. Louis, and they know I'm a college president. They walk right by me. He said, what can I do to come to your college? We made it happen. Wrote letters to the embassy. We got William here. William came to Arkansas Baptist College. Now, I want you to listen to this because he taught me something with no education. I put William in our GED program. William said, President Hill, he said, I see you working with inmates. I see you working with prisoners. He said, those people that come to school here every day, he said, I heard when they go back to prison that they get to eat three times a day in prison. He says, is that right? I said, yeah, because I speak in prisons a lot. He said, I've heard in the prisons that they have running water that flush the toilets, just like we have in the dorm. Is that correct? I said, yes, William, that's correct. He said, I also heard that they have electricity like we have in the dorm, that lights just come on and they go off and they don't have to light candles like I was used to in Rwanda. Is that correct? I say, yeah, that's correct. He said, well, lastly, he said, they got TVs in prison? I said, yes, in the commons area. He said, how? I said, William, why do you keep asking me that? He said, because President Hill, I have a lot of friends in Rwanda. If they came to America, if they came to Arkansas Baptist College, after one day, they would do whatever it takes to get in your prisons. <laughs> See, it's a matter of perspective on how we can change our communities and put the neighbor back into the hood. Thank you so very much. So my first thought is, it's less of a question, more of a comment, but I wanna get your, your feedback on it. Something jumped out at me in, in your talk about $3,000 to incarcerate someone, $7,000 for a Pell Grant. $30,000, 30000 $30,000 yes. for a Pell Grant. Okay. $30,000 $30, for incarceration, yes, $7,000 $7, yeah. for a pill. Pill. Mm -hmm. uh, It seems like when you do the math on that, the investment on $7,000 on a pill grant, I mean, it's black and white, right? That's what I, I mean, would think. The, the, the long-term economics, the return on that, and, and what are you, you getting out of that $30,000 for incarceration? It's going in a hole, no pun intended. And the one reason that I'm big into prison education because research shows that any inmate that gets a master's degree has 0% chance of returning to prison. Zero. But we don't invest. And so there is a lot of different ways and a lot of different angles, but you're exactly right. I'm not a, you know, I'm not a math major, but I can do that math. 
Like you said, it's not calculus. Not calculus. It's basic that's math, basic right? math. One plus one. What kind of programs do we have here in the state um, to help young men, young women when they exit incarceration? What kind of things are we doing while they're in incarceration that are actually rehabilitative? Is that a word? Yeah. Uh, and then once they leave incarceration, what kind of programs do we have for them to transition them back into society to be productive? Well, well, we've been working on a program now for seven years, the Fellowship Bible. In fact, that's the program that William Karen Beasley was referring to. They're actually Arkansas Community Correction. They actually come to Arkansas Baptist College every day with a, with a, with a, a guard. These are nonviolent offenders. Uh, these are individuals who come, who need grace, who need opportunity, who need love. I say if you give people three things and you give them to them that order, that they can transform their lives. Love, food, and godly expectations. When you do that, people can transform. But so many times we want to take people and say, oh, I don't know why they wear their pants down that low. Well, nobody told them to pull them up. When you know better, you do better. And I believe this. <laughs> I really believe this. I've seen so many people judge, and I say, when you elevate the mind, the pants come up. I believe that. <laughs> Tell us more about the uh, Civil Rights Responsibility Program. I think that's yes, absolutely sir. brilliant. Right. And, and, and if I can say so, I don't think that's a black community thing. No, I think a, that's a community thing. We all need to recognize that, our entire community. Exactly. So we have the Derek Olivier Research Institute for the Prevention of Black-on-Black -black Violence. When I told his parents that I would never let Derek name be forgotten, that if you come through, if you drive through campus, you'll see this house, this historic home, built in the 1800s, being renovated in honor of Derek Olivier. And it's going to be the research think tank for the prevention of black-on-black -black violence. <laughs> we'll be housed there. On August. The 20th, we're hosting at St. John's Baptist Church our first action summit, not a talk summit. What we're actually doing with uh, Sergeant Willie Davis, Little Rock Police Department, to be in Dunbar Middle School, Central High School, Forest Park, and Little Rock Hall, and how we want to expand that throughout Little Rock. This is a long-term strategic plan. This didn't just start. I was reading Arkansas Times about the crime back in the 90s. It's taken 20 years to get here, and we can't fix it overnight. So we can't put this problem in the microwave. We're going to have to put it in the oven and cook it. It's going to take some time. So everybody wants right now. It's not right now. It's going to take some time. So we have to have a strategic plan, but this research think tank will give us information for best practices, and so we can move, up, move our city forward and hopefully create a national model that can be replicated, duplicated. And Little Rock, is easy enough to do change in the area because of how small we are, unlike New Orleans or New Jersey. How can I help? How can we get involved? When you come down, you'll see there's plenty of opportunities. If you'd like to come over and see what's going on at Arkansas Baptist College, email me. That's how it all happened. People say, hey, how can we help? People came over to the institution and, say, and found a way to get in. Like I always say, I don't know what your passion is, but get in where you fit in. Thank you, Fitz. Thank you.